Hello, welcome back to the Podcast Producers Podcast with me, Neil Mossy. Welcome back to the Happy Hearts. It's, as you can probably hear, it's bleak midwinter here in the UK. But we're going to get indoors with Stuart Morrison, who's a SEO expert, as quickly as possible. I just wanted to say thanks for all your support with the episode so far. We made episode three. I really want there to be music running underneath this. I might put it on in the edit. My nine-year-old son has written a theme tune, which I'd, uh, I'd like to try out. We found out in the last episode that 18% of podcasts never make it past episode two. So we've already crossed that hurdle, and I hope this helps you to get your podcast online and to keep going with it. That's the whole point of this podcast. In this episode, episode three, we meet with Stuart Morrison, who helps businesses gain more visibility online. So I thought that would be perfect for people like us trying to make podcasts. How he got into that game and gained his expertise is a, it's an amazing story. And he's also the host of the Signal Borden Hub, which is where we went to have our chat. We're in a room that says therapy in progress on the door. <laughs> um, welcome to my couch, come lie down. So the idea of the podcast producers podcast is that I get to talk with as many podcast producers as possible to help anyone start their own podcast. Okay. And just as a fruity, capricious idea to start the show, I don't know if I'm going to stick with this as a format, Go. but I thought it might be better to get to know you firstly, Stuart Morrison, Okay. with one question, which is, do you have a podcast that you listen to religiously? Do you have a, a podcast that you're always checking out? Yeah, yeah, Maron. Maron, oh, the yeah. governor. Yeah, Maron. King uh, of podcasts. He's just, I mean, I, I came to him through a very circuitous route because I was looking for something to watch on Netflix and I saw his series on Netflix and then I saw his specials and then I watched and listened to his podcast and I just love his honesty. Sometimes when people on a podcast, they put on a personality and okay, that's fine, you know, that's entertainment if you want it, but it just feels like you're getting Mark Maron. I've only just noticed there's a, a little touch of the, the Mark Maron look about you. Is there? Oh, no. <laughs> well, <that's just> <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I, I know, can I'm see that. I'm just seeing that. you in logo form. Oh, no. Uh, so that's uh, WTF with Mark Maron. Yes, that's it. Yeah, I love absolutely. the way he opens the, the show. I won't say it now because I'd like this to not be sweary. And yep. not to be no. <laughs> uh, but that's it. Mark's you know, expected. he talks about his cats. He talks about the fact that he's doing it in his garage. Yeah, you know, yeah. he's had the ups and the downs. And to a certain extent, you show the showing, which is very Brechtian. So you have this old guard who are all very top surface veneer, it's all about the showbiz. But with things like uh, Mark Maron, you get to see the production and he's just stuck at it, you know. Yeah. And I think, for me, that's the story that all entrepreneurs miss out, is they do something once, it doesn't work and they stop. Yeah, You can't. You need 10 years of failures under your belt and get used to failing bigs, failing fast, failing spectacularly, failing very publicly, but fail because in that failure, you should be learning your craft. Well, it's funny you should say that because this is the second episode of the Podcast Producers Podcast and it's a huge uh, leap of faith. I started two podcasts and one went really well, but it was a closed series. The other one, I just hit this wall. It's just the psychological wall of keeping going with it. Mm. So then I decided to park it for a moment and just talk to all my friends, everyone I know who's been close to either producing a podcast themselves or anyone who actually has skills that might be needed for podcasting. And, and Stuart, you are probably better known as Mr. Metric. Well, that's my business, yeah. And that's what we're branded as. And I'll put this in the show notes, but you... Your business is mrmetric.com. Yes. So that's M I S T E R. Full spelling of the name, Mr. Metric, as in measurement, dot uh, com. And it pops into my head that, oh my God, I should be talking to you about. It, it seems that when you start a podcast, it draws upon so many superpowers hmm. that, that then you might be stronger on some and weaker on others. So you might be good at booking guests, you might be good at scripting for yourself. You might be good at the audio production. You might be good at the uh, the graphics and the cover art. And you might also be good on the computer side. So you might be good on editing and audio processing. 
and putting it out there physically as a, as a thing, as a feed. I might be wrong, but I just wanted to talk to you about this because it seems to me that your superpowers are in that area of optimising a podcast to actually live online and to be found. Really. Yeah, I, I, I work with a lot of businesses that uh, want more visibility online. The old term is SEO, SEM, search engine marketing, search engine optimization. Do, do you like those terms? Um, for, I used to rail against SEO because the whole thing about um, Google is don't try to manipulate the search rankings. So if you're engaged in SEO, that's exactly what you're doing. And therefore, there is no white hat, black hat. You, you are trying to, you're not just letting the chips where, fall where they may, you're actively seeking to improve your search ranking. Google has, over the years, made it clear that if you do this overtly and with malicious intent, then they're gonna likely uh, penalize you if they find out. I think it's perfectly acceptable these days to uh, try to make the best of yourself. It's a little bit like going to a job interview, you know, you wouldn't turn up in jeans and a t-shirt. And to be fair, if you're engaging in the sorts of things that Google want the uh, end user experience to be like, um, so you're making your content fast to load, you're giving it uh, lots of rich content that the end user is looking for, then that's a good thing for everyone. How would you describe your background, how did you end up oh, doing God. this? <laughs> yeah, um, have we got two hours? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started out as an engineer, but I wanted to be an actor. And my dad w was very much of the opinion that if you have a trade, you can always fall back on it. But this was in the mid 80s and things were changing and changed rapidly in the 90s. And mid 90s, I decided that it was now or never. I had to break away from engineering and do what I wanted to. I didn't want to be on my deathbed and think to myself, why didn't I do, why didn't I have the courage of my convictions? So I literally w walked into work, handed over my uh, notice, and uh, I didn't really have a plan other than I wanted to be an actor. And I figured that, given enough time in the day that I wasn't being distracted by a job, that I would, I would find something. And I was committed to doing anything that I needed to, to achieve that. I, was, I, I did lots of things. I did car clamping. I <laughs> emptied out burnt out buildings. You name it. I, I, if somebody was going to pay me to do something, and it was legal to, to do, then I was going to do it. And part of that was selling the internet. So uh, an old internet service provider was Netcom UK and I was part of the sales team that rolled it out. That, that sort of gave me the impetus to get online because back then it wasn't easy. You know, you needed a modem, you needed a, a dial up, um, a CD thing that you used to put into your computer and then you went into this world of websites and they were all just simple text websites. You know, if you had a picture on it, woo. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so it was a lot more difficult back then. But I started to look at things like passive income and whilst this was going on I'd had some success with a poster I used to buy them in Athena Woolworths and that kind of thing and this poster sold big and then off of the back of that we sold more posters then I got I found a novelty company that would take some of my wacky ideas and then I started doing the design for their boxes uh, box art long and the short of it was the poster itself uh, was put into the permanent collection at the Victoria and Albert Museum People have worked years and years and years to have apparently the, the, the accolade of having their work enshrined for all eternity in uh, a museum, and I did it on the first day out. Oh, what was the poster? It was, was it easy to. Search yeah, it, it was a colour chart, yeah. so it had all the colours, and then it was really, really disgusting uh, and subversive and weird and bonkers naming. So it was uh, juxtaposition of the colour and the and the and the name. Right, which is so sacred and profane. Uh, kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, it was called tacky shit. Oh, okay. uh, and I had this whole backstory, like it was a German conglomerate, industrial conglomerate, that had merged with this paint company, uh, this this Japanese paint company, and they translated all the names. And but they had done it quite badly, bad, clumsily. really clumsily. Like, and this was the colour chart, and it was called the Taki Shit colour chart. So it was the Takimoto organisation and the Von Shit uh, organisation. Oh, so S C H S C H I T T. Yeah, yeah. So it's T A K I S C H I T T dot com. It's Fantastic. still up. You can still go and buy it. I've got an interactive one which has got sound effects on it as well. So you can press it and you just hear the sound effect and it's the juxtaposition of the name, the sound effect and the colour. <laughs> Love a link to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, in the show so. notes. 
And so how did you get from the extra ring oh, right. to, okay, yes, to the search engine optimizer? Uh, so obviously working for the internet company, I had access to the internet and I saw, I almost, the moment I was shown it, I, I instantly got it. It was like an alignment of my DNA with it. You know, I was like, this is going to change everything. Like everything. What, the, what year was this? 93, okay. 94. No, yeah, 93, 94. All of the stuff to do with affiliate sales and affiliate marketing, it was all about being seen, so finding an audience. So that was where the SEO interest in SEO came because I was realised that the people who would succeed online were the people who could get in front of the search engines and get at the top of them. So that piqued my interest because that was where the money was. It doesn't matter how good your product is, if you haven't got anybody or if you've got a product that nobody's searching for, so what? So I was doing that and a friend of mine came to me and she was in a band and they did weddings and that kind of thing. And also she did a Madonna set where she performed Madonna live and it was fantastic. You know, she had two dancers, they had a full band performing all of the classics, but she was also doing the latest Madonna and at the time it was the Madonna with the white Stetson and the fur coat. She asked me to manage them, I said yes. One of the things I wanted to do was build them a website and publicize them to all of the agents, the that I could find. I wanted to do a calendar because then the agent didn't just have a picture, they had a nice picture on their wall that changed every month, but it was my customer, my client. I was looking at the videos to, for, for inspiration because I was thinking, excuse me, if we could recreate like an iconic image from each one of the videos, that would go a long way to selling the idea of her as Madonna. And one of the videos that Madonna had done was Ali G. So I thought, yeah, that'd be fun. We'll get an Ali G in. I was absolutely staggered that an Ali G lookalike wanted 500 pounds just to turn up and stand around in a photograph. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I reckon I'll get myself a fancy dress outfit, I'll do Ali G, it won't matter about me because it's all about Madonna anyway. Anyway, got to the photo shoot, I got changed, I came out, I'd grown the goatee in and all the rest of it, and people were just like, oh my God, you look just like him. I was like, shut up. And so I started doing the voice, you know. Hola, swallow back, this be drive by FM, the sound of the girl, straight out of stains. This is the sound of the spell for an underground. I thought nothing of it. I thought it was a fun, fun shoot. Anyway, sent it off and I got a phone call within a couple of days from one of the agents saying, yeah, we'd like to book both the acts. And there wasn't both the acts. There was one act and me in a fancy dress outfit. I said yes, because as I said, you say yes, it's all details. And uh, I was a, suddenly I was an Ali G lookalike. I went out, I built my own Ali G website, aligforreal.co.uk, and uh, built it up, got it to the top of the search engines. In actual fact, if you typed uh, lookalike at one point, there were six of the results were me for the word lookalike. So this was about the mid 90s, perhaps late 90s? Towards the end of the 90s. Yeah. This was maybe, maybe early 2000s, 2001, 2002. One of the lookalike agents in the audience said to me, That's really good, but what are you going to do when Ali G sort of fades into the background? And me being a joker, I said, oh, I'll do Little Britain. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from Richard and Judy's people, a live talk show, um, and said, Come on the show and do your act. So I said, Yes. I didn't have an act. I figured that at some point an adult would step in and stop me. But I won and off of the back of it I met my other half of the Little Britain acts, um, Gavin. So yeah, Little Britain really, really went nuts. Like, properly nuts. Gavin is a really good sales guy. I optimised the website for all the right search terms. Every day the, the phone would ring two or three times with people wanting to book us. Um, and then we hit 2007 and the uh, credit crunch sort of rolled into town and uh, people stopped booking us. A lot of our work came from corporate, though a lot of uh, sales and marketing agencies using us for events, and those just dried up. I also, at this point, had a young family, and I was touring, so I was away for days at a time, and when you're away for four or five days, and your child is young, you know, I missed my daughter's first steps, I missed their first swimming lessons, you know, there's just so many firsts I missed because I was away or I was busy with the act. You know, you just get sick and fed up and when you wake up in a, a hotel room and you're not sure where that hotel room is because it looks like every other hotel and you're literally lying there scrambling in your head thinking, is this Aberdeen or was Aberdeen last night? Yeah, in those days, they, I mean, proportionally, they are chunks of your child's life. Yeah. And if they've only yeah. been around for a year or two, a week is a really significant yes, absolutely. percentage of yeah, that life. Absolutely. The universe stepped in at the point where I was starting to get disillusioned with it. It sounds as if your creative output was kind of in harmony with the SEO 
skills that you were developing that you would that you were running your SEO for yourself yes as an agent as an SEO agency I was my own customer right so you know I had SEO hat on in the morning and sales hat on in the afternoon the entertainment agency as it were even though I was my own customer it kind of failed and I sold my house and my plan was to maximize the sale of the house right at the height of the credit crunch not to use an estate agent so I built my own website for my house. Um, I put all of my sales and marketing skills into it, all of my search engine skills into it, and we beat right move to the top of the search engine for a very specific phrase. It was uh, property for sale Guildford, which was the most highly sought for phrase that I thought we needed to uh, appear for. We got seen, there was a bidding war, and we sold the house for 98% of the pre-credit crunch price which was a decent chunk of change. We had no sales agent fees, but it was a case of what am I gonna do to earn money, you know, scratching my head. It was at that point that uh, things started to change. We beat the Bright Move, which is the largest sort of house selling business online. And that got us noticed by the estate agents. You know, they'd go to Google and they'd type in property for sale Guildford because they wanna see where the other, where their website was and other competitors' websites. Yeah. And there's this, one house <laughs> website called property for sale guildford.co.uk wedged above right move and they want to know how I've done it I had phone calls from estate agents saying how did you do it and I'm like well I'm not going to tell you but I'll do it for you uh, how much and I tell them no 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 and it was but looking back on it it was only a few hundred pounds you know that nowadays if you could get that keyword yeah. and allied keywords You'd be quizzing. But that gave me the clue that I needed to start to educate businesses around search engine marketing, search engine optimization, and their website. What, what is perhaps for you the most basic principle that we should be looking at as, as people who are starting a podcast? What would you say would be the first basic principle? So if you're going to create a podcast, create a podcast that people want to listen to. Generally speaking, there are two types of podcasts. There are informational and there are entertainment. And you have to decide what is yours. And just because it's informational doesn't mean to say it doesn't have to be entertaining. And just because it's entertaining doesn't mean to say it doesn't have to give out information. But what I've realized is that if you are going for purely a chat show, then you need to have your own unique take on it. There has to be a reason for it. So the first basic principle is what is your aim? Choose an aim of uh, perhaps how you want to change your audience or what you want to achieve with the podcast? Yeah, I, I would set out with a topic, a niche, an audience in mind. Another basic error when they're designing uh, something is they think in terms of an audience and actually you should only be thinking about one person because it's only going to be one person interacting with your podcast when they're listening to it. Generally speaking, you're talking to an audience of one that's made up of thousands of individuals. And I think that people make this presumption of talking to an audience, whereas they should take the late night DJ approach of, you know, when that late night DJ is whispering to you in your ear, they're talking to you, Neil Mossy, yeah. you. A lot of the times I think that people try to perform. It's that Mark Maron thing again. They put on this veneer and people don't want to hear a veneer. They want to hear you, you know. Yeah, and the raw truth. They want to hear the raw truth. Yeah, yeah. I think for pod casters if you're going to pick a topic and a niche do it in a way that's surprising interesting and engaging don't just present it as uh, a Haynes manual of A to B this is what you do fantastic so the, so the first principle is what is your aim be clear think about one person and be vulnerable and risky so for this the podcast produces podcast I want to share this journey in real time it's brilliant and if I'm falling flat on my face no that's great will get better and you will watch the podcast get better well, there, with you. <laughs> there are, there are, there are, so you can create content as an expert. In other words, I am the expert, you come to me and I will dispense the pearls of wisdom. You can create content as a complete newbie. I know nothing, but let's discover what I don't know. Or you can have a journey and that's, I know nothing, but let's follow me on my journey to Great. expertise. The journey one is probably the one that is of most interest because um, there's always going to be a guru, an expert of flavour of the day. The newbie approach is interesting to start with, but ultimately, if you're not progressing, 
why bother listening? So the journey one, I think, is the one that most people can get behind. That every man of, I've decided to do this, let's find out what I don't know, let's, let's go on the journey. And I, I quite like those. Those are my favourite. There's a thing called LGR, Lazy, um, Lazy Game Reviews. And the guy who talks, he's got a really great voice. He's got like a real proper voiceover voice. But he does these ones where he reviews, he does screen grabs of old, you know, 8-bit games and old computer gaming. And he does these reviews of them. Then he moved into the technology that was running the games. And now he does the lazy game, LGR Thrifts, where he shows you walking around these thrift stores. He's obviously got these video glasses, (laughs) picking up things and going, oh, I remember this, this is a great thing, but it's broken and it's not worth it and puts it down okay. and he produces those sporadically and I, I like those because they're showing the showing yeah. it's like I go to these thrift stores as part of LGR and I buy these games and, and these trinkets and these uh, this old tech and you're following me on my journey. If you're going to do 100 podcasts and commit to 100 podcasts your 100th podcast is going to be hugely better than your first podcast, which is going to be full of ums and ahs, and the lighting's not going to be right, or the the sound, you're not going to have the best mic, and we all start somewhere. And I think it's really honest with the audience, and I think an audience always appreciates honesty. What would the second basic principle be? Don't buy it off more than you can chew. A lot of the times, people decide to do something which is vastly outside of the scope of their experience. They don't even, you know, they do a hundred of them and they still don't make any progress and then chances are they'll have dropped it by the time they got to five or ten because they've vastly overestimated how quickly they're going to progress to their goal. So they they buy it off way more than they can chew. And it's like, right, okay, I'm going to get 100,000 viewers on my podcast channel by this time next year. And they're starting with nobody online knows them. They're not in any group. You know, if you're doing something for the love of doing it, keep doing it. You know, there's plenty of t- people out there who are doing it as a hobby. It doesn't necessarily have to be a commercial thing. I'm saying that if you're going to do something commercially, then you need to put some parameters around it and not bite off more than you can chew. Well, that's, that's brilliant. So the second principle is don't bite off more than you can chew. And to illustrate that, I think what, what you're saying is that biting off more than you can chew is actually setting yourself an outcome that's completely outside of your control, whereas yeah. um, things you can chew are things that you can control. So if it's to commit to making a podcast a week or to uh, get to a 10th episode, yeah. you can control yes, those absolutely. things. absolutely. That's exactly and, it. And that is what you can do. <laughs> Is there a third principle behind um, yeah, that? Yeah, 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 definitely. And I see this in really big businesses. Uh, so it's not just the newbies that start out. And this is not having a workflow or a process. So your principle is to have a workflow yes. and a pipeline yeah. and a process. Yeah. If you're producing a podcast, there are a number of steps that you're going to have to go through from the point where you start out and to the point where a podcast is out there. Now, when you start out, it's going to be a meandering path as you figure out what to do, you read up on stuff, you go down blind alleys, you learn some things. But you should start writing down, okay, I then do this, and then I set the settings for my processing to this, and I know that's going to take an hour. And literally right now, a little process timeline like that will make you realise exactly what you need to do so you don't miss anything. As you move along, you'll find things and shortcuts and go, oh, I don't need to do that. Oh, there's a website that just process, I just upload it. It automatically connects to my podcast hosting. It's five pounds a month. For the two and a half hours it takes me to do that, it's worth the fiver a month. Understanding that process means that you can improve that process. It's when you're just pulling in ad hoc things and everything's a mess and you don't have time in your diary and you know, okay, this is going to take an hour, this is going to take an hour, this is going to take an hour. Book that time in with yourself and have the process written down because then you can improve it. I think this is where I hit a wall with my podcast, which is that you've got lots of things happening simultaneously. So it's it's as big a leap to record an episode and you've got to edit it process it but while you're doing that and you're recording new episodes you're also simultaneously having to build a home for it or just getting the thing online and those are completely conflict with each other because you, you think what's the point of me recording new ones if I haven't 
real life doesn't work sequentially. So let's say you're going to release a podcast a week schedule. That's your schedule. However, one week you might record two podcasts because you get access to the two guests you need. You still have to run the outcome of those interviews through a process. And it might take you 10 iterations of the show or 20 to understand fully how that workflow actually works with you in your diary and for booking interviews. Uh, and, and just generally getting it out there because once you've got it out there, the hard slog really starts because you're then going to need another workflow of how do I publicize my podcast? What activities do I engage in? And it's just repeating that every single episode that will build your audience. Maybe, <coughs> know, maybe an answer because in my, in my head I'm thinking, oh, one week, one week. Maybe to get started, it might be better for the process to go for one a month. If you get a backlog of things to release, great, then you could step it up to a fortnight. Or it's best to be week. regular and reliable than ad hoc and sporadic. So if you are going to commit to one a week, know that you've got the time to absolutely commit to those one a week episodes and what that means in terms of I have to set aside 12 hours of my week however I fit that in around what all my other commitments are I have to do 12 hours a week to be able to release that episode knowing that I won't have any audience for 100 episodes. Is there another basic principle you can share with us? Yeah be very clear about what your goals are don't bite off more than you can chew is more about setting things up and, and getting things going having clear goals is okay there are things that are outside of my control like I can't control the number of subscribers I'm going to get but I'm going to make sure that I'm going to earn 500 pounds a month off of my podcast by this time next year there are going to be elements of that that are outside of your control but there are also elements where you could think to yourself, right, if I'm going to do that, what needs to happen? And that's a really good question. What would have to happen in my business for me to make £500 a month off of my podcast? Right, so for instance, if you set this kind of a goal, that will then work back to you thinking, well, I need to do a call to action in, in the podcast. Yeah, you know, it'll exactly. It'll affect how you make it. Exactly. Because you know what your, what your goal is. But finally, on the basic principles, are there any, any others we should bear in mind? I would also suggest that people invest in themselves. You invest in equipment, you buy the best camera you can, buy the best microphone you can, but there seems to be an underinvestment in people's own abilities. You're gonna learn some of it on the job, but you can short su shortcut success by paying people who've made all the mistakes to tell you what's mistakes to avoid and to listen to them. It baffles me how if somebody says to you don't do something, why you would ignore them when they're the expert in, in their field. So yeah, listen to the experts and invest in your own skill set. So the final question Go is, is episode titling. What would you call this episode? And what would be a good way of making a title for this episode so that when it goes online, it will find people who would be interested in this particular topic? How to succeed at podcasting? Podcasting success and how to avoid the pitfalls. Something like that, you know, something that's like shortcut to success, avoid the pitfalls. I always try and think of an emotional word that makes somebody connect emotionally, you know. Yeah, something that's visceral, okay. something that connects, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, if you, if you fail, you fail big style, and we have helped you avoid that. But I would probably try and keep it below 164 characters, just so for the search engines, so that it doesn't spill out. Excellent. I really like podcast success, avoid the pitfalls. That feels, so we'll see if that ends up being the title of this episode. We'll see. Stuart Morrison, thank you so much thank for, you for your time. It's been really generous. Not a problem. Where can we find you if we wanted to get in touch with you or see your work? Uh, my own personal business is mrmetric.com, M-I-S-T-E-R, metric, M-E-T-R-I-C.com. That is a website designed to help business owners maintain and support their website in a healthy way. There's a bunch of tools there. There's a few things that you can do to check out your website. Uh, I also do consulting with businesses, which is how I got involved with Signal. And I run a thing on a Wednesday uh, in Borden called the Borden Hub, where business owners come. We have a number of different uh, activities that we get involved with, but the whole point is about supporting businesses. And that is my whole raison d'etre, is to help businesses succeed by avoiding the pitfalls. We'll put all of those links in the show notes 
and in the description if you're watching this on YouTube thanks for clicking on this video it would help me enormously if you were to click on subscribe because if I manage to get the thank and you and the bell click the bell <laughs> if I manage to get to a thousand subscribers that's my goal it feels it's impossible it's a goal you've got no but it's you just write down all the activities that you think now that you can do to get a thousand subscribers. Even if it's like I, I've got, I know a thousand people. I'm going to write to every single one of them. That's you know, that's what needs to happen. Well, this is and this is why I'm asking you to to be so kind. If you got this far into the video, it would really help me keep going. Also, if you have any comments or questions, we just say hello. Uh, that you managed to get to this point in the Yeah, podcast. if you've got any questions f for me as well, I'll come back and I'll answer fantastic. them in the comments. Oh, that's fantastic. No oh, that's, that's really brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And if you're listening to this on the audio podcast, there's a link to the audio podcast in the YouTube description. You can subscribe there and this journey, these episodes will appear in your podcatching software. So I'd really appreciate any subscriptions there. And thanks once again to Signal Hub in Borden for being our hosts and providing us that's with a quiet room. Brilliant, yes, yeah, yeah, they, <laughs> and, and that's what they do. They're there to support uh, and, and nurture new businesses and, and small businesses. Thanks for watching, and I guess I'll see you on the next episode. Can you please help my daddy get 1,000 subscribers? Just click on his face. Thanks. Bye.